right, so today I'm talking about the treatment of acute Achilles tendon rupture. Um, this is an interesting topic as the, the treatment has changed for, for late and there's been some new evidence that's come out. Um, this, as you all recognise, is a picture of Achilles, uh, one of the first Greek orthopedic surgeons uh, to come out of Greece. Um, and as an interesting aside, uh, just to give you guys a bit of a history lesson again, so the word Achilles comes from the uh, hero from the Greek mythology and the story was that uh, his mother, Thetis, dipped him in the river Styx, which was this river that granted uh, invulnerability. But uh, as she did so, she was just grabbing him right over the Achilles tendon there, stopping him from fully drowning. Um, but like a good mother, she was able to pull him out. So he was invulnerable everywhere except the back of his heel. Um, and so when he, uh, in the Battle for Troy, uh, he was shot by Hector's brother right in the heel, and that was his, uh, his one weakness. So the... Uh, <laughs> anyway, back to the Achilles tendon. So uh, it's made up of both gastrocnemius and ciliar muscles. Um, and they combine form the Achilles tendon, with the uh, majority of the tendon portion being from the gastrocnemius muscle. The tendon inserts into the superior calcaneal tuberosity, and interestingly, the fibres actually spiral 90 degrees, running from medial to posterior when they insert into the tuberosity, um, and this creates an elastic recoil that also allows uh, energy storage to allow greater propulsion um, during uh, plant depression and, and step off. Plantaris uh, is evident in 90% of uh, patients and that runs medially uh, as one of the vestigial muscles uh, in the leg. Um, and the key issue with Achilles ruptures is the poor blood supply. Uh, you have this watershed area here which has uh, been shown in other studies to be on average about 5 centimetres above the uh, insertion point. Um, and the blood supply from these mesotenal vessels are quite poor. Um, and so you have a relative area of avascularity which can make it prone to rupture. Just showing uh, in cross-section here what the Achilles tendon look like, you've had these longitudinal tenocytes um, and collagen fibres that are arranged in fascicles, um, and these fascicles are bunched together to form the tendon. Around the tendon you have this paratenon, um, which you see surgically when you dissect it out. Interestingly, the Achilles tendon, unlike other tendons, which just have a flexor tendon in the wrist, don't have a, a, a synovial sheath, and so um, some of the healing capacity comes from synovial fluid, so there's no synovial sheath here, and that can also make it prone to rupture. Um, here we see it, just a, a quick graph on stress and strain relationship, and this is for any tendon, but at the resting phase, the collagen fibres are actually, actually relaxed uh, and in a sort of wavy appearance, and as you increase the strain, they become taut. Once you get above about 3% strain, uh, upwards of 5%, you start getting these little micro tears in the collagen fibres, um, and this is consistent an overuse type injury and you'll see later that that can be a cause for Achilles rupture as well um, and then eventually when you get greater than 8% strain you can get full thickness tendon rupture. So uh, who do Achilles tears are occurring? Well usually it's people greater than 40 and more commonly in males and they talk of this uh, weekend warrior, the, uh, the classic office worker by during the week and then the uh, sports hero over the weekend uh, commonly doing some exercises they're not accustomed to uh, squash or tennis um, and it's this calf contraction eccentrically with forced dorsiflexion that can cause the rupture. The majority of these ruptures occur during sports um, and the rupture site can be variable so commonly um, the ones we repair tend to be at this watershed area but you can get high tears in the muscular tendon junction which tend to be treated non-operatively um, and also really some tears actually get the insertion itself. Tears can be partial or complete, and the acute versus chronic, but I'll just be talking about the chronic ones today, uh, the acute ones today, sorry. So uh, it's thought that the cause of these uh, Achilles ruptures are due to both repetitive micro trauma um, and this hypovascularity in the area. So it's not uncommon for patients to have some prodromal symptoms of uh, some pain and ache in the back of the heel uh, a few days or weeks beforehand, and then for it to suddenly go. There's various risk factors of which corticosteroids um, are common. Fluoroquinolones are a class of antibiotics such as ciprofloxacin, which has been shown to be associated with, in general, uh, spontaneous tendon rupture, as well as damage to hyaline cartilage. Um, some other medical uh, comorbidities here. And mechanical overload, whether it's footwear or a sudden increase in the uh, usual training schedule that may cause this, uh, as well as cross-training. All right, so uh, often on history, they have sudden uh, pain in the calf associated with an audible snap or pop. Um, and again, usually an unaccustomed exercise that causes this. On examination, they often have some bruising uh, and swelling over the back of the Achilles with a palpable gap in full thickness ruptures. 
Um, and the Thompson test uh, is what we usually use with the patient prone um, and uh, the ankles hang off the side of the bed. Uh, squeezing the calf uh, on the good side results in uh, plantar flexion and on the affected side results in no plantar flexion. This is a good sign for Achilles rupture. Again, in, in the chronic rupture scenario, you often have no palpable gap and negative Thompson test, but you can have evidence of excessive dorsiflexion. This is usually demonstrated with the knee at 90 degrees in the prone position. You can see the foot seeing excessive dorsiflexion. Investigations, uh, really, Achilles rupture is a clinical diagnosis, but ultrasound uh, can be useful to confirm the diagnosis, although operator dependent and not completely accurate. Um, MRI, I believe, is only really useful for, for determining incomplete rupture and also to assess uh, degeneration in the tendon. So the management uh, is really what I want to talk about today and this has changed of late. Um, classically, non-operative management was for those greater than 60 years of age, uh, diabetes, peripheral vascular disease or the smokers and this was often in an Aquinas cast, non-weight bearing for about six weeks and then starting to weight bear in the camper with heel raise uh, and slowly reduce that over time. But the concept of functional bracing uh, is one that um, I, I think probably needs to be looked at and, and we should consider adopting to our practice. Um, and it's really where you've got like a camber type uh, brace that has um, a dynamic component to the hinge, not allowing, this is probably not the best picture here, but not allowing more dorsiflexion past neutral, um, but allowing plantar flexion. And they actually get going and start moving straight away after surgery. So classically, there was a 10% re-rupture rate with non-operative whereas operative was much less, less than 3%. This is one of the main reasons why people advocated fixing Achilles tendons was because of this unacceptable high rate of re-rupture um, and also the thought that there was uh, reduced push-off and, uh, and strength. So the operative uh, management really was, was always done the young person um, and mainly Achilles tendon repair, end-to-end -end repair was, was what was done. Reconstruction and, and uh, tendon transfer, again, more in the chronic scenario. Interestingly, the natural history of an Achilles rupture, if you did it out in the middle of the desert with no non-operative management or operative management, um, you would have difficulty with push-up, running and jumping, but still able to walk around with the other muscles around the foot. So operative management, uh, open is certainly what I've been familiar with, but there's people advocating minimally invasive and percutaneous approaches, and this is to minimise the, um, the high rate of complications you can get around the, with the wound breakdown and infection um, from this approach. Um, and usually we do an end-to-end -end repair, like here you can see just a standard Kessler suture um, and then VY lengthening and, and tendon transfer in the chronic scenario where you've got a retracted tendon of greater than four or five centimetres and you need to actually lengthen the, the whole Achilles tendon. Usually um, the approach for surgical repair is with patient prone. Uh, it's often good to prep both feet um, and this is to assess tension. You don't want to have the feet hanging off the end of the bed because that'll put it into too much dorsiflexion, but prepping both feet so then you can get an idea of, of what the normal side is like. Uh, either a direct posterior or posterior menial approach, um, taking care not to injure the cereal nerve is, is uh, appropriate. Opening the paratenon and then dissecting the the tendon. Here's a, a common appearance of what you see where it's really more like the two ends of the horse's tail um, of this ruptured tendon um, and then pairing that tendon with an end-to-end -end repair and then usually a circumferential uh, proline suture to invert the edges of the tendon. Complications uh, really is one of the reasons why people advocate not fixing Achilles, uh, infection, DVT wound breakdown, nerve injury and, and, and re-rupture were, were the issues. So looking at the evidence uh, and how that's sort of developed over the last uh, 10 years or so, so it's been probably back since the 80s that people have been advocating fixing these and even earlier. Um, Moller et al. in 2001 looked at 112 patients that were randomised, non-operative and operative, and as you can see here, a much higher rate of re in the non-operative group, however high complications in the surgical groups. That's why people tended to fix the Achilles in the young, fit, healthy person without comorbidities, um, and this was the thought at the time. Um, Khan et al., which was a group out of Perth um, at the Hollywood uh, Private Hospital, um, in 2005 published its meta-analysis of 12 randomised controlled trials and again they found that the operative repair had a much lower rate of re-rupture of uh, 0.27 relative risk but again that 10 times high rate of complications and they did comment at the time that functional bracing seemed to have a lower complication rate uh, compared with the uh, standard casts and non-weight bearing braces but they didn't get into that too much at the time. One of the articles I did look at was this AOS guidelines from 2010 which was 
one of the most useful sites I have ever read. Uh, <laughs> It was apparently a systematic, uh, sorry, systematic review of 16 recommendations they were making on chili structures. However, almost all of them were weak or inconclusive. There were two consensus statements on what they thought without any evidence should be done, and that was that uh, history examination should be taken, um, and that probably uh, open repairs should be done in those with comorbidities, but there's no evidence to back that up. So the only thing they had a moderate recommendation for was that early post-operative protected weight bearing um, was advocated, uh, but they didn't say whether it was embracing or not, but then going into bracing that the use of a protective device to allow early mobilisation was advocated. Uh, but clearly there has been over the years a lot of conflicting evidence, um, and more recently you'll see that things have changed. So again, the same group from Perth published another meta-analysis in 2012. Um, the reason for doing this was because there had been some new randomised control trials that had come out, and they wanted to again reassess the landscape so here they describe the re-rupture rate of 4% versus 10% again favouring surgical repair. Um, so they still advocated this but the higher rate of, of wound infection uh, complications in the surgical group. There was considerable variance however in the non-operative treatment protocols. Um, and so that they said it was too hard to, um, to come up with meaningful numbers on the non-operative management because there's a lot of heterogeneity between the groups. Some were treated in CAR, some were uh, functional grazing. So a couple of years prior to this, there was the starting to emerge more good evidence, or better evidence, I should say, for functional rehab. Um, and what I mean by this is having the patient really from two weeks um, at the very latest to go into like a, an air cast or a cam boot type construct with a heel raise in and starting range of motion exercise and also early weight bearing. Um, so in this study, they looked at 144 patients that were randomised to operative and non-operative, um, all of them non-weight bared for two weeks. And then at two weeks, they got out, this was everyone, got out and started weight bearing in the cast with the heel raise up to the eight week mark. And they were actively able to dorsiflex and plyoflex below neutral. There was no significant difference between the re-rupture rate between the two groups or uh, no difference in the loss of motion and, uh, and the power. So uh, again, the I think the understanding of tendon repair is not completely understood, but there does appear to be some advantage to tendon repair with early range of motion and actually um, getting the, the muscle contracting the tendon working, which whether it's a, a blood supply thing that it stimulates, not, not completely sure, but there is that evidence. Um, and finally, this is, is the meta-analysis that I think was, has been discussed recently at AOA, but um, a group out of Canada, Sorosino et al, published in the JVS in December last year, uh, again, did a further meta-analysis of 10 randomised control trials, again, operative versus non-operative management, comparisons in all of them. Um, and their rationale for doing this was that the previous meta-analysis that I mentioned excluded four recent randomised control trials from 2004 onwards. Um, and these guys thought that there was some significant evidence here that was going to change things. So they looked at re-rupture rate, range of motion, calf circumference and also strength. And overall, out of all their patients, they found comparing operative to non-operative, there was still a 5% absolute risk reduction rate of re-rupture in the surgical group, which is what has been known previously. However, uh, having a look at this forest plot, so these are all the um, RCTs that they looked at, this is the re-rupture rate, and just to show you, favouring operative management on this side, non-operative management on this side. The overall, which is the red dotted line here, of all studies was in favour of operative management. But when you broke down the, the randomised control trials into those that had functional rehab, which was that early weight bearing in a brace, versus the non-weight bearing six weeks in a cast, you can see here that there is no statistical difference. I think the rate was about 1%, but that wasn't significant, between the two groups. And this was functional rehab, early range of motion, no difference in the re-rupture rates. Um, now, I know that they've, they've sort of selectively done the randomised controlled trials to show this, but uh, I think previous research really hasn't um, looked at that difference, and the heterogeneity of other studies has meant that this is something that hasn't been quite apparent. When you looked at solely the ones that were treated non-weight bearing in plaster, again operative versus non-operative, there was an 8% lower re-rupture rate in the surgical group. So this is where I think the, the previous evidence is focused on that uh, non-weight bearing, um, non-operative management hasn't been ideal. So it's quite interesting that, that there's that significant difference there. This is looking at the non-re-rupture complications, again a similar type graph. So these are things like wound infection, uh, nerve injury, adhesions, etc. 
Um, and here again, you can see that favouring non operative management. So, an absolute risk of 15% higher complication rate in the operative group, which again is, is what, has, what has been expected. So, they found also there was no difference in the strength, range of motion, and functional outcomes between the groups. So, as I said, re rupture rates are equivocal and then much higher rate of complications between the surgical groups. So, certainly a, an interesting meta analysis to look at. So, I guess in conclusion, um, Achilles rupture is usually diagnosed clinically. Um, surgical repair has historically been associated with this lower rate of re rupture rate but higher complications. Um, and uh, perhaps a shift towards uh, non operative management can be considered. And either way, operative or non operative, probably early functional rehab uh, in a brace is something that, that we may think about or should think about adopting. Um, and that fewer complication rate with non operative management can be useful. All right. Other questions?